Group of Sterncaster Goldstein and Fox, and is co-chairman of the firm's, firm's nanotechnology practice. In addition to strategic patent co-creation management, Mr. Peterson prepares continuous technology agreements, IP audits, and performs due diligence investigations. He is a former patent examiner of semiconductor devices. Mr. Featherstone received his JD in intellectual property law, especially tracked from George Mason University, and a BS in electrical engineering from Lafayette College. Respect is an associate in the electronics and nanotechnology practice groups of Stone, Kessler, Goldstein, and Fox. In addition to strategic patent portfolio creation, he continues technology agreement, he audits and performs due diligence investigations. He was formerly general counsel, counsel of an early stage technology company. And the business career has So if you look
going to migrate and change on the sample Examples um, of applications, patents that are now maybe have come out and issued already. Life sciences, security of material. one of the levers actually uh, the, the presence of, of the target. Another looking over here to the right are gold spheres when they are radiated with a certain wavelength of light they will read that energy to form of heat and when applied to the tumor cell for example theoretically they could possibly destroy it. Just a couple of examples. A couple more examples we have here um, wires prior to harvesting on a substrate for various applications. One application in particular, um, here is a flexible display, perhaps of a LCD uh, emitter, um, but various uh, transistor and semiconductor many applications for wires, for um, carbon nanotubes, and the like. Um, a lot in uh, photovoltaic uh, devices, the research going on right now, in cells and medicines, and uh, of course, also in, in the tools. Themselves. Our perspective here is a wide range of applications. Exciting. I, I guess just also comment on that in terms of the wide range of applications. And it's certainly exciting from a business perspective, but it's also important from a, from a patent perspective, from a licensing perspective. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. When you get into your fields of use and how are you going to carve out your space, limit yourself, yourself move around. In fact, people talk generically, oh, nanotechnology, but you really can't talk about it generic nanotechnology. Every one of these areas has its own peculiar little issues. So it's important as we look at these to consider, as the, you know, just the context, you know, energy, electronics, nano tools, a little different. And it's important, obviously, in the business setting, but also important, and we'll go into a little bit more in, in the IP setting, and, and particularly in the Licensing. And in the, in the licensing, licensing, we'll talk about uh, term. And one of the aspects as it relates back to these interesting technologies is uh, near term, we've got material um, used in various different applications, becoming products um, and less Uh-oh. 
once you will have a So as we look at, at the, the nano landscape of the business, is it going to be a dot com bust? Or is there something real? And again, you know, one of the senators in the, the science community, most promising and exciting fields. And, and again, this is uh, you know a potential IP for IPO for NanoSys. And NanoSys, uh, we proudly would say it's one of our clients. We, we've worked with them, and and, and they're being considered. And I pick up the USA Today one morning or one afternoon, and uh, you kind of get tired sometimes of writing uh, applications on, well, just leave it at that. <laughs> um, you know, I try to get away from my clients. I go down to lunch, and there's Nanosys on the cover of USA Today. Who would think of Nanosys, a nanotechnology company? And they're comparing Nanosys, which, by the way, has no revenue, has no products, nothing. What do they have? They have a huge portfolio of IP. But they're being compared with the likes of Microsoft, Netscape, and Google. So this is the sort of the business environment that, that you're in, and all of it, or a lot of it, is really based on the IP. And, and it, it makes it very interesting. I don't even know what my perspective was supposed to be on. Lots of hype, but is it real? You know, so, so yeah, all the hype, are, are, are we real? And what's the difference here, you know? The science is real, and not to, to sort of differentiate it with uh, the dot-com. The dot-com, the science was real, but it was a lot easier to put a facade up, namely a website, uh, that made it look like you were real when you really weren't. It's kind of harder to do that in nanotechnology. The science is a little bit more hardcore, and it's hard to, to fake it. So, so there's a, a greater degree of confidence that, yeah, the science is real, and there is a real industry growing here. And, and that translate, what's it translate into? To, again, continue on the, the business side of this into money. Um, and, and, and keep in mind that the, the VCs and the investment community, they're still stung by the dot com. So they're walking around pretty conservative right now with their, their hand on their back pocket. But nonetheless, the, the growth in nanotechnology venture capital is, is phenomenal, particularly when you think, OK, this is about the dot com bust, right? And it's just going up and up and up. And it's continuing. And you, you meet with the, the VCs, you talk to them, and they talk about how be, they're being extra conservative. And what are they looking at? They're looking at IP. I mean, obviously, they look at management team and the other things that are important, but they look at IP. Does this company have a foundation to build a business on? And so the perspective here, again, the, the VCs are noticing. And you know, I, I put this slide in because I'm not sure why I put it in, actually. I, I guess it was. Harrison Harris is a, is a venture capital group, and they exclusively invest in small technologies, sort of anything from the micro level down, but primarily playing in the nano, nano space. And preparing for the talk, I was like, well, I was looking at some of the different things I wanted to say. And again, I'm not exactly sure why I put this in, other than maybe I kicked myself for not investing in them. Um, but if you look just a year ago, I mean, they were down at $2, $3 a share. And most recently, they were up at like $15, $20 a share. And this is basically one of the only, it's kind of an index fund of sorts, where you can invest in the nanotechnology space. And it's getting a lot of play. And right about here in June of last year, Mike and I gave a talk on nanotechnology and intellectual property with one of the directors of uh, Harris yeah. & Harris. And that's why we're kicking ourselves that we didn't buy then. Yeah, she was encouraging us. and we. <laughs> Kind of ignored her, so we were our, we were skeptics. I mean, I, I'm still a skeptic because, in the intro, it talked about the the business that I was a general counsel was. Well, we, we were part of the dot com bust. This was a, a broadband company, and I saw so many things that were just unreal, unreal business and unreal business expectations. And you see some of that here, but it, it's not quite the same. As again, the science seems more solid to me. Um, and just one last thought on the, the hype versus reality. I mean, Wall Street is really noticing. Uh, in, uh, you know, the, you saw that chart on Harris and Harris, but just in the, in the last couple of months, even uh, the growth and and one in indicator of that is you know this this nanotechnology index was created, um, which is this punk Ziegel or Zigel. I'm not sure what the, even the pronunciation is. It's an investment bank out of New York, 
launched this index so people could watch the stock performance of nano companies. The, the thing about all these nano companies, they, they evolved into nano companies. When they went public, they weren't really nano companies. They were doing something else. But so two points. One is, yeah, Wall Street is noticing that it's, it's happening. There's this, this wave is just building in nano. The other part of it is there's real products. These are real products, most of which they're selling, and some of which I have no clue what they are, but, uh, but that they're out there selling these products which are, are based in nanotechnology. Most right now are either in nano tools or nano materials. Um, you don't see anything in devices or sort of higher, higher level applications. That was interesting. So what's the role of intellectual property there? <laughs> Not sure what happened to the. Well, this is not working well on the, the projector, so I'll just tell you what was up there. So now we're, we're going to migrate from okay, you've heard enough about the business side of things, and, and sort of laying a landscape for for what are we thinking about in intellectual property and, and sort of the the, the construct. And, and on this slide, basically what I was looking to show you was. There, there was a couple quotes up here. When Nanosys um, most recently received a, a round of private financing, it was a $30 million round um, where it had a handful of the leading VCs investing. And without exception, the, the comments that this VC made was their investment was based on the wide, the breadth of the IP portfolio of Nanosys, the ability of Nanosys to essentially corner the market uh, based on their IP portfolio um, in particular areas. Certainly, you know, focus on, on, on some specific areas. And the other comment was actually from uh, the director uh, at Harris & Harris, who we participated on a panel with. Her comment was interesting to me and, and really highlights the importance of IP, not just in nano, but in, in general, um, where she, she talked about how IP colors their perceptions of every aspect of the company's business. It's not just about, yeah, they've got a patent here or a patent there. It colors the perspective on the sophistication of the management, sort of the lay of the land of the industry, how they're managing their, their budget, their finances, and it really is sort of colors everything, and, and particularly in this space because IP is so absolutely critical as these companies are are grabbing, it's, it's kind of like the, the land grab, you know, in the, the movie uh, Far and Away, uh, with the, the Tom Cruise movie. I have this vision of, of all these nanotech guys on their horses with their guns running out, and it's the, the Oklahoma land rush, and, and they're running out there to try to claim their turf and get the biggest area and the best area. That's kind of really what's going on here, where they're doing that. The interesting thing is they have to partner with the universities because the universities own a lot of that land already, and, and there's a lot of licensing to, to carve up chunks of it. Um, the last part of this uh, slide here, and, and the last thing that I'll say for a few minutes, we'll turn it over to Don. Oh, look, it's flashing for us. Um, I'm trying to do that. From here. Oh, um, was there? There's a company in Nanogen, and, and just one other comment on the importance of IP. They had one patent issue, and on that day, their stock jumped 50 percent. I mean, so people are watching IP in this industry like, uh, oh, there you go. Uh, so they are there, 51 percent increase. And so it is so important here, and which now finally leads us into the different issues that we're, we're going to talk about specific to the, to the IP, and we'll, we'll come back to the question there now. How do we play this game? You know, what are the, the, the issues that are unique to nano? Um, I mean, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I I'll, I'll, won't jump too far ahead for our uh, outlining where, where we're at at this point. So where the action is. Really, this is what makes this exciting. And quite frankly, you know, at our firm, uh, we debated whether we wanted to have a nanotechnology practice group or not. You know, is this another hype? And are we just buying into the hype by having a nano practice group? And really, when we looked at these kinds of issues, this is what drove us to, yeah, we want to have a nano uh, practice group because it is real, the science is real, and IP is so critical here. And, and we think we can add tremendous value because where, where are the issues? Okay, certainly patent application, and prep and prosecution. There is new research, new discoveries going on every day and a lot of them, when you have $950 million from the government pouring in on an annual basis and now VC money coming in, the tech transfer. How do we get that, all that interesting research out of the, the government's uh, research labs, out of the universities to, to commercialize it? you know, licensing, technology transfer, 
And then sort of across all of this is the IP strategy development. You know, what percentage of your budget do you focus on IP if you're an emerging nanotechnology company? Where do you play? What's the field of use? How do you leverage your, your technology into a field of use different from what you thought you were going to be in? You know, it's, it's an asset sitting there. Maybe you can leverage it elsewhere and keep, still keep your field of use protected for your own business development. So I'm just about out of breath. The, you know, I will pass it over to Don and take a breath here. This is just some statistics from the Patent Office <coughs> concerning the filings. As you can see here, um, based on these different technology areas, it clearly uh, cuts uh, across all of the, the, the main categories at the Patent Office, particularly um, the Patent Office is, is usually broken up into three main categories, um, mechanical, electrical, and biochemical. Um, and, and that's what you can see here. Um, there's an awful lot of pressure uh, being put on these examining cores to, to deal with nanotechnology. Um, the questions have been raised, are you going to um, create uh, separate examining cores or not? Well, we'll get into that individually, but um, uh, I mean, they've got their hands full. And um, I think that with the, uh, um, what has happened with the proposed budget, uh, not the one Mike's talking about, different proposed budget, how they're going to, the federal government's going to spend money. Um, in the past, the Patent Office um, has not um, had the benefit of its own filing fees. When pe people file their patent applications, the Patent Office doesn't keep the, get to keep all that money. They were basically a profit center for other areas of the Department of Commerce. Well, uh, under the, this proposed budget, the Patent Office will be able to keep that, those filing fees, and they'll get a budget increase. So hopefully, the Patent Office will be able to hire some examiners, some more examiners, um, to, to dig in and get the backload of applications down um, and start examining some of the nanotechnology filings that are coming in, and hopefully um, have the money to, to, uh, to hire uh, talented people with the necessary background to, to work on nanotechnology. From our nanotechnology uh, customer partnership meeting, some statistics they threw at us. Um, um, this is a, a, another moving number here. They said about uh, 1,500 nano-related patents have issued. They did their statistics, they searched their different databases, and they called out you know, things where they just talked about nanometers um, and referred to dimensions that had nothing to do really with nanotechnology. That's the number they've come up with. Um, they've also indicated that they are beginning uh, examiner training. Um, they've actually asked us to work with Nanosys, for example, to bring uh, technologists in um, to have uh, working sessions with the examiners to, to do more of the, uh, the, the training um, at the tech, deep down in the technology and to give the examiners an idea of where the sources of information are concerning the research, research that, that has been done. Um, so uh, various other companies will be uh, invited to the, the Patent Office to do the uh, training as well. Um, for the time being, uh, the Patent Office has, has elected not to create uh, specific uh, examining groups to handle nanotechnology because of the previous slide I showed you. You know, it's all, it's all over the, the lot, so to speak. Um, and additionally, uh, from the perspective of classification, um, these are just some example classes um, that we were given as to where a lot of cases are falling. Um, but uh, uh, to date, they don't have any plans to, uh, to revamp the classification system with regard, with regard to how patent applications will be um, examined by the core. I, maybe Go just a, one comment on that. I think one of the things they did mention that was, was useful in my mind was that they were sort of, I won't say oversight, but they had this nano task force. Clearly, it would be impossible to try to create a, a nano class or a nano tech center, but they were getting together so the, the main um, tech centers within there that were touched by this to have, a, in a sense, an oversight task force that would look and, and monitor how nano was evolving at the, at the PTO and then the consistency of, of the examination and how things were going. So there may not be a, a separate class created or a new tech center, but at least they have this kind of oversight group that's, that's watching this and, and we'll see how it develops. I think that has a potential to be very promising or, or positive. So, sorry, Don. Oh, that's okay. Okay. The usual suspects, novelty, obviousness, enablement. The Patent Office pointed out these three and some others that we'll get to. Um, uh, interestingly enough, one of the uh, areas of law that they didn't talk about was um, statutory subject matter, um, whether something has utility, for example. I understand one of the uh, uh, the students has put together a paper and is getting it published on, on that particular issue as to whether uh, nanoparticles, for example, or, or new things that have been actually in existence but new uses are being found for them, uh, whether they will be patentable. Uh, and 
it's interesting questions, but not something the PTO is focused on. Um, we'll get to one of the issues um, that they're going to focus on in a minute. Um, and for the, the students here, we gave you your sites just so you uh, can feel back at home. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, essentially, there's one patent law for every technology. Okay, they're not going to develop new patent laws just to handle nanotechnology. They didn't do it for uh, biotech. They didn't. They didn't do it for superconductivity. Um, and <coughs> we can name many others. That, that, you know, we're going to apply the existing patent laws to to this technology. One of the main areas that the patent office did talk about was inherency, um, and uh, inherency will lead into what Mike will talk in, in a couple slides about. Is you know is just making something small going to impart patentability? Um, well, um, the, the, the famous legal answer is it depends, of course. All right, But uh, inherency, essentially whether um, the, the uh, native characteristics of something that, that existed before um, um, can actually be patented if someone discovers them. Um, the, the patent office will probably take a pretty strong line in that, as they always have with inherency. Um, with enablement, um, an, an, another important issue in, in, in patent law is how much do you have to prove, essentially, in your, your patent specification when you, when you write your application and file to the patent office um, um, uh, to enable those skilled in the art to make and use the invention? Um, what level of specificity do you need? Do you need, if it's the mechanical, do you need a blueprint to, to, to uh, um, implement it? No, but you have to teach enough so that those skilled in the art can make and use the invention without undue experimentation. Um, they're going to look uh, at enablement, but at the same time, they're, they're going to also consider the, the predictability or the lack of predictability with regard to that technology. Um, in particular, in the chemical arts, uh, predictability isn't the same um, as it is in the electrical and mechanical arts. So in the electromechanical arts, we don't have to um, necessarily provide as much enablement in the patent application because the predictability um, is more specific and, and, and things are predictable, um, whereas in other areas of technology, they aren't. So um, in effect, depending on what nanotechnology you're focused on, will really um, um, determine from the patent examiner's perspective as to uh, how much enablement's in the case. And, and that, like I said, depends perhaps on the predictability of, of that specific technology. Don, you um, have a question. Uh, just uh, I, you, you, you may have touched on it a little bit, but it, it seems like in the, in the chemical and bio arts, lots of times it, what will show up as an enablement issue is really an operability issue. You know, it's not that you didn't teach us how to do it. We just don't believe that, that, that it's going to do what you say it's going to do. Um, mechanical and electrical arts, those don't, those don't show up as much. Have you seen uh, more of that type of enablement rejection in nanotechnology than, than you would have otherwise, particularly for mechanical and, and electrical? Uh, we've, we've been pulling some file wrappers and trying to evaluate that exact question. So we have a little more depth of knowledge in that area. We haven't completed that analysis yet. Um, some of the, we're actually going to throw up some claims and some, and some slides and kind of go over some of this, you know, pie in the sky type claiming that's going on. Um, and uh, it's interesting. It's very interesting. And we'll see. Uh, we don't have any data on that yet, though. Um, and, if, you know, what you're referring to here also kind of gets, gets, gets to the heart of your question, the breadth of the claim. You know, um, um, are, you, are you claiming something too broadly, you know, that you have not enabled or, or it's not operable? Um, at that level, you, you've only provided the species uh, and enabled one species as opposed to the entire genus, right, or the, or the, or the general um, um, claim that you might have otherwise been able to get had you had more species enabled, for example. Um, so that's what they referred to. Um, um, so you're, you're right on it. Uh, it's, it's just going to be a matter, I think, of the specific cases and what areas of technology they're in. Well, and, and maybe oh, just to oh. comment on that bef before we leave it, I mean, certainly these concepts are very much related, right? I mean. Because it, as a practitioner, uh, we don't know what the answer to your question is yet, right? I mean, it's still evolving. So, so as you'll see some of the claim examples we give, they're claiming the world. I right. mean, we start out by claiming the world in, in the nanotechnology area, and then you know down to yeah, we're you know identifying the chemical compound and, and the very specifics. So you're seeing a lot of applications in the, in the nano space that you know 100 claims, 200 claims, 300 claims or more. I mean. Don was mentioning one of 500 claims, uh, an application that we saw. A little odd, right? When sort of the norm is uh, if you have 20 claims or less, you don't have to pay an additional, additional fee, right? So you put that in perspective. I mean, these guys are coming up with 500 uh, claim sets of 500. But 
the point here in, in the relationship, I mean, one, that aspect, but this is kind of a double-edged sword for you, right, as, as you get into this. I mean, on the one hand, we're arguing nanotechnology, and, and this leads into the next slide, size does matter because there's some unpredictable nature to it, right? And, and therefore, we can get these, these wide claims because it wasn't known. But in the other case, we don't want to spend a lifetime writing the spec and trying to enable it, so we're trying to rely on, there is some level of predictability. Yeah. So the challenge for the practitioner is getting on that fine line and, and really having your cake and eating it too, because what are we after here? The broadest claims we can get so our client can essentially monopolize that space within the industry. And uh, I mean, that's a perfect segue. One last thing though about, about the inherency. As we're going from our, our Newtonian world down to the quantum world, you know, there are certain other effects that are, that are taking place at that level. Uh, surface effects, for example, and and what you know inherent properties those effects have um, alone probably won't be patentable. However, if there's some solution that's being s solved based on the fact that you're making that that uh, that size reduction, okay, or you're taking advantage of those effects to solve some problem that had yet to be solved, then that's where you're probably going to get patentability imparted um, and get over and, and get over the inherency hurdle. Yeah. I Go ahead. Federal Circuit has also tried to cut down on the scope and how broad they are. Nanotechnology is a land grab, like you say. Given that, where do you guys think the PTO and later the courts are going to then go on interpreting the breadth of these pioneer inventions? You, you want to take the first crack at it? I, I'm, I'll take a first crack. I'm more willing to throw myself out to the crowd here. But um, I think, in terms of when, when you, it's truly pioneering in. in you know, it's, it's recognized in the industry as pioneering. And I mean, the, the examiners and, and the PTO, they, they read the literature too, you know, they're out there in the real world. When it's truly pioneering, I think they're gonna be inclined to give, give broader claims. You know, when, you know, when it truly is and they feel that, yeah, it, some level of enablement exists. But if, it, if it's, you know, this 500 claim application and there's a question of what's going on and, and it doesn't seem so pioneering and it's not recognized in the industry as wow, I think they're, they're not. They're going to be very suspicious of that given the biotech experience and some of the pressure on the, the uh, PTO as a result of some of the, the method uh, issues and method claims from the past, that they are going to be a little bit tighter and, and hold this to a, a tighter scrutiny, if you will. And so that, that's my sense. If, if, if you can convince me it's really pioneering, I think they're going to give you broad claims. And, and some of the things, you know, maybe this is... I don't know. My inkling is it's going to be pegged more to the area of technology that that, that nanotechnology is really applied to. Yeah. It, you know, it's if it's closer to the biotechnology, right, um, there may, might be a little more uh, dubious of, of the scope of the claims and, 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 and yeah. try to limit them more. Yeah. I, w I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's going to be sort of the intersection of the, these two concepts because, yeah, they're, they're going to be less believing. but. Um, the other point, I mean, and part of uh, related to this is I think for this sort of an interesting intersection of sort of the Newtonian world and in quantum mechanics and where you have sort of interesting things that happen at that interface, I think you're going to have an opportunity for pretty broad claims uh, because it is that there are things being discovered that are, are truly phenomenal, you know, that people didn't expect would exist at that interface that we're just able to now see with some of the new tools that are coming out that you can experiment and find the, these things. And, in that area, maybe uh, you know, broader claims will be allowed as, as well. Um, I don't want to say anything else about it. I'll, we're going to come back to inherency, but that's the one that bugs me the most, is inherency. It's the hardest one as a practitioner to respond to in, in a lot of respects. It's kind of like your word against the examiner's word in, in some, some respect. You know, they, they, they don't have a good art to, to tell you this is why it's uh, you know, obvious or, or not new. And so they just say, well, in my experience, or the examiner thinks, and so then you got to argue with the examiner, and that's, we'll come to that. Uh, just, we'll come, finally come back to the, the size uh, probably does not matter. You know, in, in, in the abstract, I don't think it does. Uh, you know, if it's just small, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, and there, there's some, some case law from like the 50s. It's a lumber case. It's not the greatest uh, case law, but basically some, some guy, figured out a different way to stack lumber, and, and it was, he was able to stack it in a bigger pile than you, you previously could, and he tried to patent that process, and, 
and, and the court basically says, it doesn't matter, the issue's bigger. I, I mean, so what? And, and so that's, I mean, you see that in some of the, the nanotech writings, that, that size alone is not gonna be enough. You're gonna have to find something else, and um, that's kind of where we try to play when we're, we're looking at some of the applications we write, is, is what else is going on here besides just size? Is there something novel or unique or, or at that interface occurring that we would not have otherwise expected? And so this, this, is, this is actually in a case that I, I'm prosecuting right now. Um, this is an office action and uh, deals with the issue of inherency. And we have paraphrased it to protect our client's interests here. So these things are, this is his, the examiner's actual language, but we've, we've made up some things in there. Um, and in this last question, you know, what it is, it's a device and they've come up with an invention that allows it to work in, at a nanometer level. And, and the prior art was working at, at the micron level, and the examiner, and, and you look at the, the prior art and, and our art, and you know, in, in first blush, they look kind of similar, you know, the devices. And, and the examiner, he says, you know, he argues, always a bad thing. Um, he argues, so it doesn't have anything to do with the prior art, that the reference that he's using against us would have the ability to detect. So he's basically got this piece of art, and in this particular case, it's a piece of I think from the 70s, and, and saying that, oh, I can do, you know, now it's uh, 2000, this device would have worked perfectly well. And, and how do you argue that? I mean, he, he knocked us out on a 103A obviousness uh, here with this inherency argument for this particular claim. So how do, these are the kinds of issues that come up in the context of, so one could argue, well, I didn't do a very good job writing the claim, or writing the claim, uh, do that good of a job, uh, you know, writing the, 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 the specification. I think, I, you know, we're going to have to talk after this. Um, but he hasn't seen your claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, yeah. exactly. Um, well, no, he's thinking that inherency usually means that the uh, item must operate in that fashion. That's usually a uh, case that I cite that says not that it can or that it might, or yeah. but it must. And the burden is on the examiner to prove that it must mm -hmm. operate in that fashion. Sure, and, and certainly that's part of my response here and then other aspects of the response because I'm not sure he'll always buy that. I mean, we, we can make that argument, but uh, other parts is, is showing what is unique and what is different here about our device that wasn't obvious or was not inherent. And, and in this case, there, there's a relationship between two of the parts and how they work that's different from, from the prior art. And that's really what allows us to get down to the nanometer scale. And, and that's the, the crux of our invention. And I would argue it was in my specification in the first place, but uh, um, I'll argue that again in the response, um, that there is something really unique going on here. And, and this is why. Um, so it's, uh, we're, we're seeing more of these types of rejections in, in the sort of inherently, it could have worked at the nanometer scale. And, uh, Don, Back to breadth of claims. Uh, the first claim is a barcode, basically with quantum dots that, that have these special uh, special uh, characteristics. This is a, probably a first, maybe a second generation RFID tag, radio frequency identification tag. Oops. You know, you have to deal with it every time you go to an electronic store and you buy something, and you have to turn it off um, or disable it. Um, this is essentially what we have here. Uh, barcodes are, are going to be everywhere and every little thing. Um, and when we get down to this quantum level, it, 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 may, it may have uh, uh, some, some really good use, but just the fact that quantum dots have these um, special uh, emissions, I, I'm not sure uh, claim one's gonna fly or not. Uh, claim two, you, you've got support, you've got an item of interest, okay, then you attach the, the quantum dot to it. Um, maybe we're getting uh, a, a little closer to something that, that, that might be allowed. I'm not sure, these are actual claims from an MIT uh, published patent application. Um, and uh, um, basically, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to issue as soon as a patent. I'm just not sure yet which, which claims are going to pop out. Um, and can you just go to the next one, Mike? Oh, here I go. Um, uh, this is a Regents of the University of California, uh, a couple claims out of that what, four or 500 claim application we mentioned earlier. Um, these are just some nanowires. We, um, for example, I guess the bottom one's a little easier. Uh, uh, first segment of one material, a second segment of a second material, um, and they've uh, uh, got this 
specific diameter uh, um, and then functionality based on that. Uh, so the first one maybe is more, more dimensionally related where they're, they're only uh, 200 nanometers long. A nan nanowire, I guess, usually is on the order of maybe you say 10 or so uh, <coughs> nanometers in, in width or in diameter. And, with, with a, and they're claiming here this length of 200 nanometers. So that's more of a uh, structural type claim. And down here we have maybe of a, a properties or, or, or functional uh, type claim. Um, um, kind, of, kind of interesting stuff. Uh, um, whether it's going to come out, um, um, I'm, I'm not sure. There's some other, other claims um, to uh, forming a plurality um, of substantially monodisperse metal nanospheres. That's the whole claim. I don't know. Have, have metal nanospheres existed before? Were they all about the same size? My guess is yes. You know, so a claim like that, I, I, I don't think it's going to go very far. Uh, but it, it, it raises some interesting breath questions as to what's going to uh, pop out of the patent office. But I mean, as we said, there, there are about 500 of this level of these this level of claim in this application. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, <coughs> hey, if they get half of them, I mean, they're in great shape. I mean, really. <laughs> and uh, this is so. Uh, I'm sure know. there was a str restriction requirement in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Um, so maybe we, uh, just move on to the to the next. This kind of way of summary on the, the prep and process. I mean, we've talked about most of these issues. How broad is too broad? I don't think that there's nothing that's too broad right now. I mean, other than um, you kind of get a, leave a bad taste in the examiner's mouth or, or in, you know, for him if, if it's too crazy. Uh, then, you know, watching out for the prophetic arm inventing and, and arm waving. I mean, we want some of that right now in the nanospace, but the arm waving is going to eventually get you in trouble. And you're in trouble, but you're not going to get them. Um, this is important. Um, the managing the invention disclosure process. So Everybody is rushing to file their nano IP or their nano patent applications right now. And this is always important, right, to, to figure out how you work with your inventors and the scientists and the research, researchers who, by and large, have no interest in working with an attorney, right? I mean, what's the worst thing you can do to a scientist? Make them sit down in a room with a lawyer, right? And, but this process, if it's not done well in nano right now when you're trying to carve up this space, is going to really louse up the business of a company because you're going to have a lot of interferences. The interference process at the PTO to basically look at who was the first to invent, uh, very simplistically. Um, and looking at partly the, the invention disclosure process and how well are these things being documented. So one of the, the, the advice to the clients is do this right here. It, it really important, even more so than in a lot of other industries. And, and it's a, a nice way for patent attorneys to, to you know, add value and, and get paid. We like to get paid. Uh, <laughs> you want to just skip this one? Well, I was just going to um, do a little bit of segue using this slide to get into the next few. We talked in, in the beginning that one of the topics is going to be uh, you know, licensing the tech transfer. Um, here with the, the, the quantum dot and you know, breadth of claims and scope of claims, you know, what do we have here? Well, we've got the basic quantum dot. You probably patent the exact that thing, but maybe a new new method of manufacturing a quantum dot you could patent. Um, over here on, on the right, there are uh, different size quantum dots in these vials, and um, um, they're excited by a single excitation source, and they and they actually you know um, irradiate different colors just based on their size alone. Well, what's so patentable about that? It's inherent, right? Well, maybe the sorting of the various different size quantum dots, maybe that would be a patent, you know, uh, um, separately. Um, and uh, uh, down here, using the quantum dot that, that has these uh, spectral emissions um, and, and tagging human cells with them um, to, to track some process, probably patentable. You know? um, so these different areas of things that you know, focus around the one idea of the quantum dot, um, you know, think about your, your different fields of use, your different ways of, of patenting and protecting the, the client's um, uh, research. Um, a vast majority of, of the uh, uh, initial patents we've seen all come out of uh, academia, out of universities, um, and um, a lot of it based primarily on government funding. Um, and uh, that's why we want to generally talk about, since we're in this environment today, uh, some, some aspects of, of nanotechnology and, and, and patent law, um, and, and they're good, to, good, to, good take homes with regard to this, this sort of thing. Um, we, we mentioned here the, uh, the field of use. Um, 
extensively uh, used um, uh, kind of a, as a multiplier uh, to, to uh, be able to uh, extract more income um, out of a single uh, invention, for example, or set, set of uh, claims covering an invention like, like I just showed, showed you on the prior slide. Um, uh, so that's, that's an important consideration. Um, and there are going to be a lot of different fields of use for nanotechnology. Um, the, uh, the term of the patent, uh, as I mentioned, and Mike, Mike may have mentioned it too, um, the uh, material sciences um, um, versus the devices. Material sciences, and one example I gave was cosmetics, for example. Um, um, uh, the term of the patent, um, we got to keep our eye on the ball, right? So 20 years from the earliest filing date, okay? Um, if you have technologies that, we're, that you're trying to protect or you, you want to extract licensing revenue um, uh, for the program, um, how long is it going to take to, to uh, get to maturity? Um, wh when are you going to be able to commercialize this product that you're going to actually get royalties on the license? Okay? So you've got to balance the type of economics that you're going to focus on in the licensing um, um, uh, strategy um, based primarily perhaps on the, on the term of your patent. And is your patent going to expire too soon? before you can actually commercialize things. Um, future development. Uh, on the same lines uh, uh, about the, the termination of a patent, right? we, can't, we can't extract royalties from a license um, beyond the expiration of a patent uh, un unless there are trade secrets or know-how um, that are uh, separately dealt with in the license so that you can go beyond um, the, the termination of that patent and still um, get royalties for, for that intellectual property in the form of the know-how or perhaps the trade secrets. Um, just a couple of important uh, aspects. Uh, whether licensing between companies will, uh, will be any different? Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, once toward the end, I'll talk about something that's between the, the uh, as the technology will migrate from the universities to, to, to the companies. Generally, based on our observations, I think that these, these funding sources, uh, government, uh, academic institutions, foundations, industries, and VCs, uh, a lot of the same issues uh, that were seen in biotechnology and uh, licensing of biotechnology inventions are probably going to be applicable to, to at least those aspects of nanotechnology um, that are related to bio or, 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 or things like that. Um, so the main take home here is to know, know about these encumbrances, and, and one of the biggest ones here uh, regarding that is, is ownership and, and uh, uh, doing your due diligence to figure out who owns this technology. Um, um, when the, uh, um, the investigators at, and the professors at the university develop that technology, it gets probably assigned under an employment contract to the university, um, but then we get into um, some other areas uh, and how that gets transferred perhaps. Um, the uh, the Bayh-Dole Act uh, was passed in 1980 the purpose of the policy was to encourage the utilization of inventions that were produced uh, um, um, based on uh, government funding. Uh, essentially, uh, it promotes the um, universities and small businesses to uh, go ahead and um, um, develop and commercialize uh, the inventions. There are, there are a lot of hooks uh, in Bayh-Dole. Uh, one of the things is that the uh, government um, or the agency who does the funding of, of this type of work that is done at the universities for example, um, uh, gets a, uh, a, a free, a royalty-free, uh, non-exclusive license. Um, so, but for that license, though, the university can exclusively uh, license that technology uh, to small business. Uh, there's a lot of uh, policing that's involved, a lot of reporting that's involved under by Dole. Um, and, for example, you know, when you when you come up with an invention, um, you need to report it. When you file a patent application, you need to report it. Um, a, a lot of uh, overhead involved in this, but. Um, interesting area of the law. Um, the last point here uh, on a jointly developed technology and, and who will own it, um, when that, that transfer, um, which is permitted under the Bayh-Dole, perhaps from the university to the spin-out, the professor um, perhaps has, has been able to spin out under what the, the university bylaws or charters are, perhaps that they, they may encourage this sort of thing. I'm not sure whether Duke does or not. Um, I'll have to take a look at that one of these days. But um, um, a lot of a lot of institutions, academic institutions, do, and the professors are, are uh, can then get that license to to start that company um, and um, and develop and commercialize that technology. However, as that that professor uh, is now out there in industry, uh, uh, comes up with uh, improvements on that invention, right? 
um, there's a problem with regard to the prior art. Okay, the prior art is that um, professor's own work that was done at the university that's still actually owned by the university because the professor now only has a non uh, has an exclusive license, perhaps, to um, to take and commercialize that that technology, but the, the original work is owned by someone else. So when the, the new inventions or the improvements are developed, they're not commonly owned. And under this section of, of, uh, of the um, uh, 35 USC, if there was a mechanism to get the ownership at the time the second invention is made, under okay, you can avoid that prior art problem. So under Bayh-Dole, there is a provision such that um, the university can assign the rights the entire rights to that uh, that small business example. Therefore, the original rights were owned by the small business, fully owned, not just licensed. Um, and then new inventions were developed or improvements were developed um, later on. That that old the, the, the original work done by the investigator, the professor, won't be prior art against against the new technology. Um, there's one caveat in there. It has to be approved by the uh, by the sponsoring agency that that transfer of ownership. I think just a comment on this. These, this is not unique to nanotechnology. All of right. the, the licensing s stuff from the last two slides is, is any technology. It's just uh, more important perhaps here because of the fact that so much of the research right now is coming through government funding, through universities. And there are a lot, I mean, a, a, an amazing number of university spin outs, uh, small companies coming out in nanotechnology, some of which we've seen have, have gotten tripped up by this, you know, not going into the details of it. Um, and just to sort of a general theme so to, to wrap up here, uh, you know, the, we come back to the business. The business plan must dictate the, the licensing strategy. And we're seeing all three of these kinds of models, you know, pure licensing, manufacturing, service provider, dictate licensing strategies. Is that don't be boxed by the uncertainty of the technology that this patient's early. This or that to keep the license alive and, and again, develop some going and which is not just that it's an ongoing process here. But even more critical here the stage and the last comment it is A few, or maybe a few questions for Don. <laughs> <laughs> one question nice try, Mike. Uh, apropos of one of the later comments, this point of being for 1500, I think at the beginning it said something like 1500 X8 patent in this case. What, roughly what kind of comes out of university for this industry or license? That's a good question. Um, yeah. We've seen a lot. Of patents from universities. Yeah, I mean, I haven't. I mean, everything I've seen is university. I don't have a gut based on sort of, you know, looking at. It. I bet it. Conservatively, it's probably way more than fifty percent. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. As opposed to the opposite with with other areas of technology. But it's it's just the fact that it's an emerging technology. I think it is. Really I mean, that may be something we can have the legal assistance. Right now, the one. Any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>